Good Tuesday morning. Good Tuesday morning. Actually, it's Tuesday afternoon. Well, whatever it is, it's Tuesday. It's Tuesday of uh, the first week of Advent. It's actually late in the afternoon, and it's cloudy out, and it's going to storm like crazy in a little while. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I want to read to you from the prophet Isaiah. It's a Tuesday text. Okay, God, this is one of the great texts. Isaiah, I told you yesterday, it's just eloquent. Elegant, his writing is elegant, and he is eloquent. And his imagery is powerful. It's, and frankly, the New Testament picks up all that imagery. Watch what he says. And you know these texts. Good grief, they are all over the Christmas, the Christmas season, okay? A shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a bud shall blossom. The history of the Jews will come to a single bud that will blossom. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. Not by appearance shall he judge, nor by hearsay shall he decide but he shall judge the poor with justice and decide aright for the lands afflicted. He shall strike the ruthless with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Justice shall be the band around his waist and faithfulness a belt upon his hips. This is the great imagery. If you, you could see this in the, so much imagery of the Christmas, the Christmas spirit. Watch this. Then the wolf shall be a guest of the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion shall browse together with the little child to guide them. The cow and the bear shall be neighbors. Together their young shall rest. The lion shall eat hay like the ox. The baby shall play by the cobra's den. And the child lays his hand on the adder's lair. There's a great line. There shall be no harm or ruin on all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as water covers the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse set up as a signal for the nations. The Gentiles shall seek out for his dwelling shall be glorious. What a magnificent text. If that isn't the hope of the entire, in a, in a way, it's the hope of humankind symbolized by the accord and peacefulness of the wild community. The wild lamb, see? That's neat. The wolf, laying, the guest of the lamb, the leopard, lying down with the kid. The end of the violence of predation. See? He's not describing the natural community. He's describing the paradise, in my view, the paradise of the Garden of Eden before the fall. A sinless world in a perfect accord with the divine harmony and the divine life. God walking quietly with his creation. It's the image I think Isaiah is calling upon. See, we surely don't live in that kind of world, do we? Not even close. I'm an outdoorsy kind of guy. I love the wilderness, and I love its dynamism. I love the, the, the hunter, hunter, the hunter, hunted prey relationship, the, the predator prey relationship. I, I see the harmony of nature, but it isn't pre-paradisal. It isn't paradisal. It's naturally beautiful in all its power. See? And we are members of the natural community. We walk and live among the wild community and the tame community, but we live as fellow members of what is wild and beautiful and good and living, you see. And that's the truth. I love the text. I, I, the poetry is phenomenal here, and so is the imagery. I love it too. But I also love the image I have when I look at the wolf. One of the most powerful experiences I've ever had in my life of the divine intimacy, and it has to be, it's going to sound odd, 
was when the wolf walked up to me up in northern Ontario, just 15 feet away from me, a magnificent animal, pure ferocity in his eyes. He looked at me and walked away. You had to see it. You had to be there. The communion I felt with that animal, an intimate experience. I kept thinking, he's accepted me. He's accepted me. I could have shot him, I guess. Well, why? He meant no threat to me. None. If he wanted to, I had no chance. None. No chance. He would have been on me before I knew I, that I was being attacked. He had no interest. He was curious about me. He looked over to me. That's the truth. And he accepted me. Now you see, to me, that's the natural. That's my image. It's not Isaiah's, but it is mine. Mine is so shaped by the wilderness, I think. I think the most powerful religious experience of my life was the encounter with the wolf. Yeah, I have to say that. Because I, I know it's controversial when I say it this way, but I felt the presence of God in the wolf because it was a visitation of life. He invited me into the, the world of reality itself, and that's God. The incarnation makes God present in every part of life. Not, not just the priestly form or the ecclesial form, but in every phase of life, because Christ became a fellow citizen of the earth, just like us, okay? just like us. I wonder if, if through the divine uh, providence, God chose to, be, to become incarnate, not in Palestine and in the Middle East, highly, highly civilized, 3,000 years of civilization, maybe 2,000 when he showed up. But, you know, well, I bet more than that from the last ice age. Imagine if he came here and he was incarnate, not in a culture that is thousands of years old in formal civilization, but in the wild community of the Native American. Wow, I can just imagine what a different kind of gospel, but a similar truth. But the imagery would have been so different. The imagery of the Mediterranean world is an imagery of civilized people living off the land through farming and, and cattle raising, sheep raising, etc. They've been, the middle, the, the, the Mediterranean world has been unwild since the, the last ice age. North America has been wild right up to the present moment. When you look at the wilderness, you go in the wilderness, you know this is wild, and you are just a fellow traveler. That's the beauty of, to me, it was northern Ontario, but also Alaska. You know you're a citizen of the world, a fellow companion, and that you are among the wild. That's why I think when the wolf appeared to me, it was so powerful for me because he accepted me. I wasn't a stranger to his world. I was a fellow member. See? That's the truth. I love the wilderness for that because I find God imminent, so powerfully imminent within it. It's a living world. It's a dynamically living world. I love that world. My father taught me that when I was a little boy. We used to go rabbit hunting, squirrel hunting. But he taught me how to feel the earth, to feel the land, and to love the, the wild community. He loved, and he loved eating rabbits and squirrels and birds, you see. But I think he loved especially the wildness. And he taught me that. Since we were drugged behind him, my brother and I, Pete and I, would stand, walk behind him when he'd hunt rabbits and squirrels. That's the truth. And we did it as little boys. We were just little pipsqueaks. But he taught us to feel the earth. My father had a reverence for life, a reverence for, for the plants of the world. He always had a garden, but also for the wild. He cultivated a garden, but loved the wild, and he gave that to me. It's my brother, too. It's in our blood. I love the wilderness. To me, the wilderness is the final revelation. It's the fifth sacrament, I guess you could say. In the wilderness, when Christ is present.